Hello and welcome to the Capitol Report. I'm your host, Steve Lance, and thank you for joining us. Here's a look at some of the stories we're covering for you today. Biden seeks to push vaccine mandates on more Americans, a tactic he ruled out before taking office. And Facebook whistleblower Frances Hagen testified to the Senate earlier this week, raising questions why she is against using antitrust laws to hold big tech accountable. A possible economic recession has been kicked down the road. Democrat and Republican senators reached a deal this week to work together to raise the debt ceiling, but they'll be tackling the same issue just before Christmas. President Biden visited Chicago Thursday to continue his push for vaccine mandates. Think, think about this. 700,000 people dead in the United States. That's more than every war we fought by double. Mm -hmm. The Biden administration is about to enforce companies with more than 100 employees to mandate vaccination or weekly testing in the coming weeks. It will impact more than 100 million Americans. However, Biden said he would not demand vaccines to be mandatory before taking office last December. No, I don't think it should be mandatory. I wouldn't demand to be mandatory, but I would do everything in my power. Just like I don't think masks have to be made mandatory nationwide. Thousands of healthcare workers have resigned or have been placed on unpaid leave over the vaccine mandates. One of the largest healthcare systems, Kaiser Permanente, placed about 2,200 unvaccinated employees on unpaid leave nationwide due to the company's COVID vaccination policy. The company stated employees have until December 1st to get vaccinated in order to return back to work. Several other large hospital companies have issued similar directives in recent days. New York-based Northwell Health terminated 1,400 workers because they didn't get the vaccine last week. In Michigan, about 400 healthcare workers at Henry Ford Health System have resigned over the vaccine mandates. Henry Ford Health System includes five hospitals. The mandates are leading to staffing shortages at many facilities nationwide. And Pfizer said that they have submitted a request to U.S. drug regulators to expand the authorization for its COVID-19 vaccination in children under 12, which is causing concern for parents across the country. And a new study shows that roughly one out of 500 children in the U.S. has lost a parent or a caregiver during the pandemic. According to a study published Thursday by the medical journal Pediatrics, within a year's time, more than 140,000 children lost a parent or guardian. The majority of the children facing these losses were minorities. Meanwhile, according to figures released by John Hopkins University, more Americans have died so far in 2021 from COVID-19 than all of 2020. As of October 6th, the United States has seen 353,000 deaths this year. That surpasses the death toll of 352,000 in the year 2020. Facebook whistleblower Frances Haugen is raising some eyebrows from conservatives. In Haugen's testimony to the Senate, she said that she is strongly against the breaking up of Facebook and holding them accountable with antitrust laws. It was reported that Haugen has made significant contributions to left-wing political groups. To dig into exactly how Facebook should be held accountable, we spoke with Mike Davis, the president of the Internet Accountability Project. Here's a look. Mike Davis, thank you for joining us on the Capitol Report. Thank you for having me. Mike, we've seen the testimony from the Facebook whistleblower over the past few days. It's been known by many that these social media platforms are toxic and unhealthy for many reasons, and just as video games. Uh, do you think that the government has a responsibility to step in, and if so, to what degree? Well, we've had our antitrust laws on the books for more than a century, the Sherman Act and other antitrust laws. And the problem is, is that we have these big tech monopolists like Google, Amazon, Facebook, Apple, who have enjoyed antitrust amnesty uh, since the Obama administration for more than, the, more than the last decade. And what we have now is we have this consolidation of tech where there are no real options. So these teenage girls who are being uh, you know, exploited by Facebook, they're, they're exploiting their fears, their anxieties as teenage girls, they have no other choice, right? Where are they gonna go? And so I think, but what the government needs to do is break up big tech. They need to they need to break up these trillion dollar big tech monopolists, and so there's real competition. And so uh, uh, the, the users of these platforms have choices, and so they're not captive audience. 
This whistleblower, Frances Hagen, it's been reported that she's been a donor to left-wing politics, including uh, to AOC's campaign. Uh, some have said that her motives to call out Facebook are beyond the body shaming and other bad things that the platform's been doing, which many have known for a long time, and that it could turn into something where uh, we see more censorship um, of those with potentially conservative uh, views. How do you see this? Yeah, absolutely. It's through antitrust. We, we don't need more regulations. Uh, we need law enforcement. Facebook wants regulations. They're calling for regulations because they're a trillion dollar monopolist. They can afford these regulations. They can afford their army of lawyers and lobbyists and PR people in Washington, D.C. that startup competitors cannot. It's a, that's an entry barrier for startup competitors. So, of course, they want regulations. We need to do the opposite. We need to use our targeted law enforcement. We need to use our targeted antitrust laws to go after these tumors on the free market, right? We need to break up big tech and we don't need regulations. Regulations are simply a band-aid over a market failure, right? And we need to fix the market failure by breaking up these monopolists. Now, is this just going to be another case of a good public shaming for Facebook and they get right back to business as usual? You know, there's, uh, I don't agree with President Biden on just about anything, but I'll tell you that he has done a good job on picking Lena Khan to run the Federal Trade Commission and Jonathan Cantor to, read, to lead the antitrust division at the, at the Justice Department. These are the two federal law enforcement agencies for antitrust. And I think that these two people are very serious about the need to break up big tech. Uh, uh, Jonathan Cantor's nominations hearing was just today before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I encourage Republican s senators to support his nomination so we can get to the Justice Department and start doing the work that has not been done over the last decade, which is enforcing our century-old antitrust laws. Mike Davis, thank you so much. Thank you. Former President Donald Trump filed another lawsuit against Facebook. He asked a federal judge to force the social media company to reinstate his account. Trump was suspended from most social media platforms following January 6th. He filed lawsuits against Twitter, YouTube, and Facebook earlier this year. On Thursday, Trump's lawyers filed for a preliminary injunction in the U.S. District Court's Southern District of Florida. The lawyers alleged that Facebook's ban of Trump violated his First Amendment rights. On Facebook and Instagram, the former president had amassed tens of millions of followers before being banned. Biden's Build Back Better agenda has radical energy programs. Will enforcing these green energy projects increase our dependence on foreign nations like China, which dominates the green energy market? Senator Ed Markey, a Green New Deal advocate, explains his proposal for how to enforce these programs while at the same time being energy independent. To make the solar panels, we need to rely on the rare earth minerals. Do you think that we can make it easier in the U.S. to, to mine for those? Yes, we can. We, we, we have to find a way of moving from mining for fossil fuels to mining for rare earths. And we can do that in the United States and then move over uh, one group of miners into uh, the new work uh, place, the, the new kinds of minerals we need for our country for the 21st century. We can do this very, very rapidly uh, uh, as long as we set the policy, make it clear the investors will move in. Uh, and they will see uh, that there is money to be made. Markey was joined by a few other Senate Democrats advocating for the bold climate projects. They insisted that all of their programs be included in the Build Back Better Act or else there would be no deal. This comes as moderate Democrat Senator Joe Manchin says he wants natural gas to be included. These senators say no way. Manchin opposes the overall cost of the bill, but Senator Van Hollen says he wants to make polluters pay. He wants to place a fee on the biggest polluters and use that money to pay for the green energy solutions. And Senator Schumer and McConnell this week made a deal to raise the debt ceiling by just a bit, avoiding an economic recession for now. The deal is temporary, so they'll be forced to tackle this issue again just before the holidays. NTD's Melina Wisecup joins us now to discuss. Melina, tell us about this deal between the Democrats and Republicans. Does it put us on a path to avoiding a debt default for the first time in history? 
Well, Steve, the short answer is yes, but it's only a temporary fix. Now, the House will have to come back next week in order to pass this uh, move to raise the debt ceiling, and it is expected to pass there. Now, this only raises the debt, the borrowing cap, by around $480 billion. So this debt ceiling drama will be readdressed again in December. Now, what made this temporary fix possible is that 11 Republicans joined Democrats in voting to overcome that filibuster, which is that 60-vote threshold, in order to make it possible for Democrats to raise the debt ceiling on their own with a simple majority vote. But even though no Republicans voted on the actual measure to raise the debt ceiling, many Republicans are still upset with McConnell's deal with Schumer after they've told the American people they would in no way help Democrats to raise the debt ceiling. Now, nevertheless, this um, raising the debt ceiling is an inevitable move by the Senate. They would have to do it no matter what eventually in order to avoid an economic recession. Steve? So, Melina, do you expect all of these same arguments to bubble up again in just a few weeks when the Senate takes up the debt ceiling again? It seems this deal is just a Band-Aid and doesn't address the real issue. That's right, Steve. And Senator Chris Coons did express his disappointment with the situation. Let's listen. It means, unfortunately, that we will be right back here in two months needing another vote configured exactly like tonight's vote in order to raise or suspend the debt ceiling going forward. Well, really, it all comes down to who should have to bear the burden and face the American people telling them, yes, we've had to raise the national debt yet again. And you know why Republicans are saying that they don't want to help Democrats for a more long term solution is because their argument still stands. They're saying that they should not have to help Democrats raise the debt ceiling at a time when Democrats are trying to spend trillions of dollars in new spending. And they're saying that since Democrats want to pass all of this new spending alone without any Republican support, they should also have to raise the debt ceiling alone without any Republican Republican help. But then Democrats are saying that this argument is irrelevant since raising the debt ceiling will help them to pay off some of the debt that was accrued under the Trump administration. So all of this political infighting is expected to bubble up yet again in December because Republicans don't look like they're backing down and, Rep and Democrats are not either. So while the situation seems stable at the moment, the economy is holding on fragile ground. Steve. Thanks, Melina. And coming up, the number of American workers claiming for unemployment benefits continues to drop, but economic recovery remains uncertain. Who will pay for the record $3.5 trillion bill? $3.5 trillion, the amount Democrats want in their historic bill to fund a variety of social welfare programs. We look into the plans to pay for it and how you will be affected. To meet key national security challenges, the CIA announces a number of structural changes including a new mission center focused on China. Welcome back. The Department of Agriculture plans to invest $500 million in order to boost competition in the livestock industry. We know that there is a high concentration in this industry. We know that it, it creates capacity challenges, especially in beef, and there is a need for additional capacity. That's one of the reasons why uh, we began the process of establishing a $500 million fund the $500 million in federal funds are available under the Biden administration's American Rescue Plan. Agriculture Secretary Tom Vilsack told House lawmakers on Thursday that his department has received hundreds of comments in response to the plan. Labor unrest at U.S. food manufacturers has stretched into the fall. About 1,400 workers at Kellogg Company's U.S. cereal plants walked off the job this week. They are negotiating for better pay and benefits. The strike includes plants in Nebraska, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Tennessee. Kellogg says that this is the first time its U.S. cereal workers have gone on strike since 1972. The number of American workers filing for unemployment benefits fell last week, while experts say an elevated level of uncertainty remains around the recovery outlook. According to the Department of Labor, last week's first-time filings for unemployment came in at 326,000. The drop is sharper than economists expected. Meanwhile, inflation is running at a 30-year high, up just over 5% in August compared with last year, with no sign of a near-term slowdown due to persisting supply shortages and massive government spending. The Senate Democrats are trying to pass a record $3.5 trillion spending bill through the reconciliation process, but this bill is so large, some Democrats have pumped the brakes. The Democrats would need all 50 Democratic senators in order to pass this bill. But Senators Manchin and Kirsten Sinema are not budging off of their hard line, 
as of yet. We spoke to David Williams, president of the Taxpayers Protection Alliance, to get his thoughts. David Williams, thank you so much for joining us on the Capitol Report. Thank you for having me. Now, David, the $3.5 trillion uh, budget reconciliation bill is on the table right now. Um, many Americans, they're, they're busy uh, taking the kids to soccer practice, picking them up, cooking dinner, working, trying to put food on the table. They don't really have the time or the energy to dig into the numbers. Tell us, if this bill were to get passed in its current form, what are some of the taxes that, that Americans might wind up having to pay? So first of all, $3.5 trillion is a lot of money, but it's also a major expansion of the federal government and what they're going to do. And the way that the Democrats want to pay for this is with tax increases. Now these tax increases are going to affect all income levels. So when you hear President Biden say that he only wants to raise taxes for people making $400,000 or more, that's not true. Virtually all these tax increases will hurt the middle class and will hurt uh, lower income folks. So let me ask you, Biden has said that people that are making under $400,000 are not going to be affected. From your perspective, from what you've seen, is that the case? That's just not true. If you look at uh, tobacco taxes, they want to double the tax on tobacco. 25% of this country make less than $25,000 a year who smoke. So when you raise tobacco taxes, you're raising the, the cost of these tobacco products on lower income people. So when you look at just that one tax, that is gonna hurt people under $400,000, a lot under $400,000. And tobacco is not something that people can quit easily. So people are gonna to continue to smoke and it's gonna fuel the black market in tobacco. We saw that in New York with Eric Garner. Eric Garner was selling illegal cigarettes and when he was arrested and eventually choked. Did I see that the uh, tax rate's gonna be raised if this goes through to 26%, which would ultimately be uh, higher than it is in communist China? That's the crazy part, is that they want to raise it to 26.5%. Not sure where they got the 0.5%, and that would be higher than communist China. It makes no sense that the United States would have a higher corporate tax rate than communist China. It is it is amazing that Congress doesn't see this. They criticize China, yet they don't want to compete with it when it comes to the corporate tax rate. From your perspective, what do you think is a reasonable solution? We need more tax reform. We need to lower taxes, not raise them, especially when it comes to the corporate tax rate, because the rest of the country is catching up to us. Right now, our rate is 21%. We need to lower it even more to 19 or 18% to keep up with other countries. It's a very competitive world. And we need to stop these discriminatory taxes, tobacco, cattle, uh, you name it. There are so many taxes that the administration and Democrats are thinking about. We need to stop this. David Williams, thank you. Thank you. Texas appealed a federal court order handed down Wednesday that temporarily blocked the state from enforcing an abortion law that went into effect last month. Texas Attorney General Ken Paxton wrote on Twitter Thursday morning, quote, we disagree with the court's decision and have already taken steps to immediately appeal it to the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. The sanctity of human life is and will always be a top priority for me. The lawsuit was brought by the Biden administration last month after the Supreme Court declined to intervene. Within hours of the ruling, Texas notified the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that it will challenge the judge's order, setting the stage for the next phase of the legal battle. The Central Intelligence Agency is launching a new China mission center to counter the Chinese communist regime, a signal that the Biden administration is moving resources to address its top national security threat, Beijing. In a statement on Thursday, CIA Director William Burns said that the new China Mission Center will address the global challenge posed by the People's Republic of China that cuts across all of the agency's mission areas. And he went on to say that it will further strengthen our collective work on the most important geopolitical threat we face in the 21st century, an increasingly adversarial Chinese government. This formal announcement uh, probably should have been made several, several years ago. They can... Uh, uh, create kind of a center to focus activity 
all the mission planning and on the intelligence community side of the house and then coordinate with the other instruments of national power. This comes as part of the CIA's restructuring plan to deal with key national security challenges. The CIA also announced it is creating a new position for a chief technology officer in a transnational and technology mission center. It's a good idea to have a, a, a science technology mission focus center. You know, there are times that, that uh, peer, ad, peer competitors, peer adversaries uh, develop technologies in advance of us and we want to make sure uh, we are able to detect that, track that, understand that and, and put the United States and our strategic partners in the most advantageous position so that in the end we prevail. To become more competitive, the agency also plans to improve hiring practices by reducing application time. President Joe Biden and Chinese Communist leader Xi Jinping are expected to meet for a virtual conference before year's end. White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki told reporters on Wednesday they're still working through what it would look like. This agreement comes on the heels of a closed-door meeting in Switzerland between National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan and China's top diplomat Yang Jiechi. Recently, the tensions between the U.S. and China are heating up over a range of issues, including China's incursions into Taiwan's airspace. According to a Wall Street Journal report on Thursday, a U.S. special operations unit and a contingent of Marines have been secretly operating in Taiwan for at least a year. And that's all we have for you on the Capitol Report today. I'm your host, Steve Lance. Thank you for joining us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you next time.